Hey, welcome back to yet another episode of your fanime. Ah, and- <laughs> oh, I always have to fuck that up. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, welcome back to another animation episode of. <laughs> I mean, it, that's every episode of Animation yes. Dissection, but well, go on. I, I'm really just fucking at this time. So, uh, well, Animation Dissection, your favorite uh, dissecting podcast about animation. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that's not incorrect. Technically, no. Uh, so, well, we are brought to you by Anthropomorphism, projecting human psychology onto the living and non-living since the dawn of human consciousness. So, of course, I am your very fucked up... <laughs> Ghost Nixie with Zorak. I mean, isn't it more the opposite here? <laughs> I mean, more the the, the anthropomorphism and saying it's more the opposite that's going on here. Uh, yeah, I'm on to you. I'm on to you, Zootopia. We all knew what this that we was. were animals this whole time, and that they've been projecting humanity onto us. No, the other way around. The the animal thing. Oh, uh, okay. I'm um, on to you. I know where you're going with this. What are, are you talking? Are you talking to the movie or me? I'm talking to the movie. We all knew what this was. A Disney movie. Uh huh. Sure. A likely story. <laughs> well, before we get into Zootopia, which is of course the topic of today's episode, uh, let's go into some brief news. Um, so there's some pretty exciting things coming out in terms of animation production software. So uh, there is a software called Toons with a Z at the end that is going to be going open source. And yeah, open source animation software is not necessarily something new. However, in this case, this is formally professionally produced software that has been utilized by major studios in the past and presently, uh, including Studio Ghibli, which has been using it since uh, Princess Mononoke. Um, and even, I think, I think Futurama even used uh, tunes as well. So that having that going open source is really interesting. Um, alongside the fact that other uh, illustration software, such as uh, Manga Studio, also known as Clip Studio Paint, is now including uh, animation capabilities. Uh, limited frames for lower versions, but with a, a larger amount of frames available to people for the ones who get the, the more advanced version of the software. Um, unlike Tunes, it's not necessarily meant to kind of directly compete with the these other software packages in terms of full production, but having that capability kind of starting up is really interesting. Um, I mean, there's also uh, a free uh, illustration software called Krita, K-R-I-T-A, that has also been doing animation in there too. So I, I'm finding this really fascinating, uh, probably for, for quite a few reasons, just because uh, the pro- proliferation of, of things like Flash and uh, other other forms of software packages to the public has really opened up the medium of animation. I mean, you can actually produce this type of stuff relatively easily with maybe even just one person at home relatively inexpensively and then put it up on YouTube. So just in terms of as an artistic medium, it's opening things up. So I find that really... And so this is just an acceleration with, of it, making it open source. So with, with Tunes is open source, is it like genuinely or open source or is it more hey, you can get this, but in order to use it for, say, like corporate uses, usages, you have to get a specialized license. Is that how it's working? Or is it the genuine, like, hey, anybody can contribute to this project. It's never going to be a charged product. Hmm. I'm not quite sure. I mean, it, it seems like... Because those are two very different things well, in terms of both the monetization and ultimate well, usage. Well, there, there is going to be a premium version that's going to be sold at a competitive ah. price, but... It's just it, most of it is still going to be pretty much available to people. So I think if you want mm. to do maybe like full on production, like I bet um, it's kind of like how TV paint is uh, un- unlike, let's say, like Flash, for example, you can do all sorts of compositing and camera movements and things like that all in one without having to send it to a program like After Effects. So it, the advanced versions might have just, again, more just more advanced features like that. So we'll see. Because I, I, I was wondering if it was going to be more analogous to the way that uh, several like sort of like software engines have become you know public to use where anybody can get them for free. But in order to get the license such that you can actually sell things using that were created using that engine, you have to actually get a specialized license that either has some sort of, yeah, we get, you know, 1% or 5% or whatever it is. Or you have to pay some sort of fixed fee at that, you know, pricing. Well, level. they're also, I think... Um, According to the article that I read, uh, the company, uh, I think it was called Digital Video, but 
the actual software has now been bought up by uh, what's it called, Duango, which is a Japanese company. Um, they're still going to develop stuff for the software itself, and they're going to do things like, uh, you know, installation, training, you know, and, and customer support types of things for, let's say, a studio that is setting it up on a whole bunch of computers and trying to, you know, form a, a pipeline. So I think they're still going to make their money that way as well as with the premium mm. version. But I think overall, there's just going to be a package available to pretty much everybody. And I think what, I mean, it does serve them a, a, a bit well. It, it acts as um, advertising. It, it allows a lot more people to learn that software for free. So that way, it's a lot easier to then sell that software to studios to go, okay, we have a whole bunch of people who are trained in it already and who use it on an everyday basis. You don't now have to spend time and money training people on this new software. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. right now, it's like, well, do you know Toon Boom, Harmony, and do you know Flash? Like you have to be trained in those types of softwares, it, and because most people are trained in that type of software already, it's a lot easier for studios to say like, okay, we don't have to spend that money, you know, and time trying to get people adjusted. They already know it, so we just have to buy, install, and set up the software. So I think this is this open source thing is both, you know, maybe it is a a a way of saying, hey, let's bring, you know, let's let's democratize the medium. But I think because it's still a private company, of course, that this is also going to be working as kind of a tool to help it become one of the one of the standard software packages out there. So um, I think uh, there was a quote. Uh, let me see if I have it still here. All right. Uh, according to the direct managing director of digital video, this deal will also be the starting point of a new exciting plan to endorse the open source business model by supporting and training and customizing tunes for old and new users. So I think the idea is that they're doing their business model off of having the open source as, as kind of a, a networking tool and a training tool and a standardization tool. So it's like, you know, it's like the format wars, but in terms of production, as opposed to, you know, VHS versus beta versus DVD versus HD DVD, et cetera. So I think that's what's going with that. Um, it's, it's not open yet, it's going to be. So I think it's gonna be sometime later in the month. Um, I, think, I think it actually might be going free this week as of recording. Hmm. So it'll be interesting. Um, I, I don't have any experience with it. Uh, I think it's because it was mostly made for uh, PC. Um, I, I'm a Mac user. Uh, so I, I never really had a chance to use it. Um, I personally use uh, TV Paint a bit more. It, it's difficult. When it comes to animation software, there's really a lot of different people who use different things. And it, it depends on sometimes even where you live and what the standard of the industry is in which you live. So like... People would say the East Coast, like New York, was using Flash for a really long time. Um, the studio, the last studio I worked at, used the old Macromedia version of Flash. You know, even till that day, um, be, you know, th before it was bought up by Adobe. Um, the West Coast is increasingly using Toon Boom. Um, a lot of Canada is is basically Toon Boom right now. So, uh, and TV Paint is used in Europe, uh, parts of Japan. Um, it, it, so it, it's it's going to be interesting to see if this becomes another one of those you know uh, standard animation softwares. How cross applicable are is like experience with those tools? Like, can you actively apply experience with say Toon Boom to like say Flash or something this, like that? Or yeah, or is it is like is it not really like applicable like I think experience beyond just general and an, animation concept just a general I mean, animation experience? Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Uh, I I have not had a chance to really go into tunes. But in terms of like, let's say you use Flash and you use Toon Boom, you'll find a lot more commonality in between those two because they are uh, vector-based animation programs and they use a lot of symbols. They, you can build character rigs and things like that. TV Paint has a bit more of a harsh learning curve because it is much more traditionally focused. So people who are used to having certain types of shortcuts and being able to reuse uh, symbols and assets will have a little bit more of a difficult time, but it has its other strengths in that it has the much more traditional look and feel. It, it ha it's, it's a raster-based uh, animation software. Um, Tunes, hmm. I, I know very little about. I mean, it was such a highly specialized software. Um, 
I think there is also another software that's used in Japan called Retas, R-E-T-A-S. Um, and that one I also don't have much experience with because many of these were just difficult to get hold of, I mean, and find training in. I mean, you know, go, go you can go to a lot of community colleges and take a class in Flash. That's how common it became. So I think making it open source means that they don't necessarily have to do this um, academic or, or, or training framework as heavily in order to, you know, uh, introduce it into the general market. So... Yes, some of the skills can be transferred over. Um, I, I think just the principles of animation and maybe certain types of techniques and keys and keyframing. But when it comes to the actual tools themselves and shortcuts and just the interface, that's probably going to be a big difference. Mm. So, like, how how long does it like? Would you say? I you know this is kind of a general thing that probably depends from software to software. Like, what is like for you, for example, who has like a some sort of background in this? Certainly. Like, what would be, like, the training time to move between programs? Like, is it, like, a considerable, you know, barrier to uh, hiring on a particular, on one coast versus on the other as a result because of, you know, the differences in the tools? Like, oh, we we need someone who has experience with Toon Boom because it would take us, you know, months to get them, you know, up to date with how to actually use it in such a way that they actually fit within our workflow versus oh no you know they you know their general animation and art skills and you know experience with other animation programs you know it wouldn't take them that long to become familiar in you know be a part of the very i would I presume is a very fast process um it definitely depends on the person and their background but i would say mm. that someone who does have experience in more than one animation software package just in general will probably have an easier time adapting to like a third or fourth one, just because they have that mental flexibility and there's, there is a commonality in all of them to some degree. Um, I would say maybe for someone who is a quick learner, um, it might take maybe a week. I mean, if, if you are a quick, uh, a quick learner and have some experience with the software, maybe you weren't an advanced user, you might not have used it in a studio environment. I mean, here's the thing is also, even with the software, studios will sometimes have their own production method and, and ways of, you know, like labeling their layers and the steps they take. They, they all have a different style within that. So even if you are familiar with the software already, like I let's say I, I know like Toon Boom really well, well, a given studio might use it differently. So there's sure. always going to be some level of training in that regard. But when it comes to like learning the software itself, if you know one software package pretty well, it's easier than never having used any, you know, coming to it. There are definitely translatable concepts. You know, the, the, the main difference you might find is maybe the steps you go through, the, the user interface will be different, but like the concepts will be relatively the same. They might just have different names for the same thing. So it wouldn't probably wouldn't be that huge of a barrier if you were to try pursuing a, uh, say, a job with one of these studios if you had experience with a previous software that doesn't necessarily align with the one that they use. There. Yes, the problem that it that happens though, and w which is why this this um, strategy is so interesting, is that so many of these software uh, packages as are are so prohibitively expensive that if someone wanted to pick one up and learn it on their own, it's really hard. It takes it, it. It's you know, Toon Boom can cost in you know about like nine hundred to a thousand dollars. I mean, they might have some demo versions, but if someone really wants to sit down and learn it, it it's very expensive to do so. So I having mean, with a lot of that's a lot with a lot of that self teaching stuff. It's always traditionally been that often people do end up you know pirating it for one reason or the other. I mean, that's that's the history of Photoshop, for example. <laughs> most Adobe products is just like hey. The vast majority of copies that aren't being used in at a corporate level, you know, because you need to have a corporate license at that point because you can't actually go and do the more illicit approach. A lot of those copies floating around are, in fact, illicit because who has the money for, say, idle Photoshopping? Yeah. You know, not necessarily for a professional purpose to spend, you know, the thousands of dollars or however, you know, it's an absurdly large cost. I don't think it's actually a thousand dollars to get like a Photoshop license. It's, you know. Yeah. I mean, it has gotten cheaper now, but I think that's just because a lot of these companies are having to be aware of just the, the situation out there economically and the, the types of user base they have and things like that. So I, I find this strategy very interesting. I think what they're I mean, hoping is from the people learning the software will come demand for purchasing it for production. 
rather than the other way around. I would also presume that the fact that, you know, for the ones that are still selling it and they're selling at a more reduced cost, like I'm sure that there are people are well aware that they're leaving money, you know, sort of, you know, uh, on the floor by not making it such a way that people who are interested in picking up these skills can actually learn the tool on their own. You know, they have to learn in the studio system. That's, you know, that's, that's losing potential profits that they could be making by making it more affordable, you know. I'm sure Adobe, for example, is well aware that, hey, by pricing it like they are, you know, not enabling people to get it relatively affordable, they're going into an environment where a lot of people are going to pick up their products uh, illicitly. Yeah. You know, that's that's a known thing, you know, for for the joke during the thou- the, the aughts, I guess <laughs> is the term we use now. The joke was that, you know, Adobe was well aware of this effect, given how prolific it was, and, and probably they were. I bet. I mean, they had to be. <laughs> yep. Um, so I, but that's why I find this strategy interesting, and I think I think it's a it's it's understanding the way people produce things now, and, and the the audience out there of animators and and uh, amateurs and and people who are interested in getting into the medium. I, I think it's a it's a, a very well thought out idea that they're doing it this way. So we'll see how it works out. Um, I, I'm going to have to probably look up some more about how the software works and see whether or not it, it is uh, that reminiscent of other packages, but I'm guessing it, it conceptually it's going to have a lot of things in common. It will just be a big interface difference. Hmm. And that can actually make a lot. That, that, let me sorry, that can, that can make or break a lot of people, being, meaning that if you, make, if you learn how to be very quick in just you know, getting through the interface more quickly, it can really help on production time, you know, learning all the shortcuts and things like that. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see what's, what's up. But I, I think it's just an interesting addition to this larger phenomenon we're seeing of um, kind of a, a slightly democratizing force of the medium itself in terms of people being having the resource available to make it. Because before you had to have the right kind of camera. Uh, the, the, you had to have like the, the, you know, the light table with the disc and paper. The, it was a very expensive thing. Almost nobody could afford to do it just on their own. Versus now, with all these alternatives, it is possible for someone with just like a, you know, a basic computer and a tablet could at least start experimenting with it and start sure. uploading to YouTube right away. So that's what I find really fascinating. So I mean, the comparison point I, I see with this is the fact that you know, there's been a broad democratization of like uh, the programming software used for developing video games these days, where you have Unity, which is open source in such a way that, or not really open source, but uh, free... T- for you know use and then there are licensing fees if you need to sell products using it and there's been a lot of that sort of thing there's been a lot of well most major engines now being used in game development are such that they are free if they're not proprietary you know in studio ones for, for anybody you know to kind of grab and learn on their own and then the cost then comes for licensing to sell products produced using it yeah i mean i think undertale was programmed in that same way certainly that was with i believe game maker studio Yes. So I, I think that's just kind of the, the new model when it comes to media production software. So either way, I mean, uh, it, it's, very, it's all very exciting uh, in one way or another. So, uh, well, let's move on to our main topic, which is Zootopia, otherwise known as Zootropolis, depending on where you live. Um, I think in England it's being called Zootropolis. Uh, and amongst they, don't, also, they don't have utopias in the UK. They don't believe in that. That's, no, they only have a, dystopias. I, I think Margaret Thatcher successfully uh, <laughs> squashed that idea. And, and Reagan didn't do it over here? Oh, wow. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we're, 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 we're still finding how that's working out here. So, um, so Zootopia, of course, was released in 2016. Um, it is di- directed by Byron Howard and Rich Moore, uh, who you might recognize as being involved in Wreck-It Ralph, amongst other things. Um, Byron Howard is a longtime uh, Disney animator who has worked on projects, I think, even back to Pocahontas when he was like an in-betweener. So he's, he's been a part of Disney for a long time. Um, Rich Moore, if I recall correctly, did a lot of stuff for like The Simpsons. And I think he even did uh, a lot of directing on the uh, Futurama uh, original series, not, not the uh, Comedy Central ones. Um, so it, I think basically this is like a, you know, a return of the team that did Wreck-It Ralph, essentially, uh, working on this film. 
Um, of course, it was produced by Disney, for those of you who are listening to this much later and to recognize it. Um, hmm. I'm not sure how I want to necessarily go about this one either. I know I keep on saying that with a lot of these, but there, um, I don't think I feel like going through the plot as much. I mean, I think it's actually a pretty well-plotted film, but um, the interesting things I see going on with it are not necessarily, you know, directly related to how things are playing out step by step, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, to a certain degree, certain elements I found in the story were, I mean, it was broadly effective, though there were a bit places that it was a bit forced to kind of fit, you know, what they were trying to do with the story. But what they were trying to do was, you know, the more interesting aspect of the film anyways. I mean, it, 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 what they had there is certainly effective and it's good for, you know, what it is. But what they are trying to do is, like, like is, is I, th I think, the more interesting thing. Well, well, let's let's go into that. So, um, well, yeah, let, let's go into that. So, like, the overall theme of this movie, I guess, is what you're trying to get at. Sure. Um, well, let's go with the premise. So, basically, what this premise is, it's um, it takes the anthropomorphism thing that we're very much kind of used to in a lot of media. You know, if you're a kid growing up, you see a lot of things with cartoon animals like Kung Fu Panda, um... God, I mean, just like almost everything. Like, it's just a really common thing that we see in a lot of our media as kids. And sometimes, like, there's no real reason for it. Like, you know, you can make the hum characters human and the story would pretty much play out exactly the same. So it's often just a stylistic thing. Whereas in this one, I feel that they actually used it really effectively to tell a story with a theme that would otherwise feel a bit didactic. Um, didactic would be kind of like a much is when something tells you what you're supposed to think. It's much more like an essay. It is a, a persuasive thing. So like uh, sometimes a story that is overly moralistic might be described as didactic. Mm. Um, I, I think they use the, the relative abstraction of cartoon animals effectively to tell a story about um, understanding biases uh, much more effectively than and than if they had done it with human characters, because I think what they wanted to do was tell something much more universal that goes beyond. I think what a lot of people have done when they analyzed it, they view it through the frame of race, and I think that's one aspect. But I think this film is even more universal in that it deals with our biases in terms of like uh, you know the body types that we see, the the uh, someone's background, heritage, um, you know uh, what we what we assume about other people and what we project onto them in terms of identity. So it could, it could be gender, it could be um, sexuality, it could be all sorts of different things. So by using you know, the, the, the relationships and, and the, the, the social struggles within this universe, it, it becomes much more universal than just doing a film about a, you know, a difference in gender or a difference in race or a difference in you know, many of the other ways that people are different. Yeah, and it's not like a direct, you know, comparison where they just took one particular one of those things and then replaced it with animal-based, you know, prejudice. Because if you were to try to replace it backwards in the sense of like, okay, what if we imagine this film as, you know, human beings of, say, different races? Like, this film would be immensely offensive in yeah. a <laughs> variety of ways because you could say like, oh yeah, they are just fair, you know, it's like bringing out feral nature and it's like, whoa! Like, well, what? I mean, ironically, I mean, not, not ironically, but sadly, you know, people have used that type of language in the past on people, but that's that's something a little bit different. Certainly, but and, and I mean, it's the effective thing is because there's no one-to-one -one metaphor to reality you know, uh, 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 comparison, you know, like there's been other books, like, um, there's a comic series called black sad that uses cartoon animals as well. Um, however, it made the mistake of going, okay, well, black fur is basically like black people and then white fur. And it just becomes a confusing and utter fucking mess because animals don't behave the same way as humans, you know, and, and trying to translate human characteristics to animals along sides of racial caricature is horribly offensive. So the movie did a really good job of keeping them as animals and not as, um, you know, a, a direct relationship like, oh, this species is this background. And then this species, you know, they're like, the, you know, this group of people, they didn't do that. I thought yeah. that was a really smart decision. Yeah, and though it also allowed them to kind of have their cake and eat it too in the sense of like, okay, we're going to talk about, you know, animal stereotypes here because that's where we're going with this. But it allowed them to both, you know, do a lot of their jokes 
being, you know, like, oh, yeah, this animal really aligns with this stereotype. And, oh, this animal really bucks this animal stereotype. You know, it subverts it. And that, you know, it's it's kind of – it's a little bit disingenuous and contradictory if you try thinking about it too much. <laughs> but it's also kind of the core of how the movie fundamentally works because a lot of the gags are based off of, you know, our idea of how different animals work and, you know, and how, you know, they, they kind of play around with that both in, you know, embracing and kind of moving away with from it. Um, you know, they, the, 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 the joke, they have an entire scene that's prolonged about, you know, like, oh, yeah, this elephant doesn't know anything. He doesn't have any memory. Meanwhile, yeah, she, she forgets everything. Yeah. And then they have like a hippie donkey basically having perfect memory. Like, boy, I wish I had memory like my elephant friend here. Uh, bah, 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 bah. And that, that was like the joke of this extended scene. And they do a lot of kind of things like that. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, well, you have you, a you claw, think... Clawhauser, the, the fat cheetah. Yeah. And, or, um, I'm trying to think of other ones offhand. Well, you have Flash. Oh, yes, of course. The, all the stuff with the sloth, <laughs> definitely. And they, they both, you know, and the, embrace. And the, end, the ending gag of the movie. Sure. Yeah. They embrace and then subvert it as, you know, they want, you know, and if you tried doing that with, you know, some sort of real world analog, it would be horrendous. Yes. But because we're talking about fictional analogs, they can kind of have their cake and eat it too with it, which, I mean, I don't know if this film would be better if they didn't, but I think I don't think they could get away with not doing it because the whole point about doing animal anthropomorphism is that you can do that sort of thing. Like it's not, otherwise you're just having animals that are people. Unless yes. you're going to have a little bit of fun with it, you know, or, you know, apply something about the animals, like, there's no point. Like, otherwise, you'd be better off just using people and doing a completely different story. I mean, yes, I, I think I think another way of putting it is essentially what they did is they created a narrative playground in which they can explore a lot of these um, touchier and complex themes. But because it's a playground, it it isn't you don't have like the harsh consequences. Like it's, you know, you have the, ru the rubber, you know, you have the sand pit instead of the cements, you know, when you fall down when, or when you're showing something that's harsh, you know? So, so they created this environment in which they can, you know, talk about a lot of the, of this stuff much more generally than being specific. So that way the, the themes still have their power without necessarily falling into the pitfalls that specificity can sometimes, you know, um, uh, hog tie you. And it, it allows sense. them to avoid getting a little too close to home. Yes. Uh, while I, I still they... invoking things that, you know, are more closer to real life. I mean, I, I'd be very curious personally about see how this film would play with someone who uh, might fall within a background that has been traditionally, you know, prejudiced against. You know, I'm yeah. I am the most, you know, white bread, you know, uh, very lucky person or not very <laughs> lucky, but very uh, privileged, privileged person. Would yes. be the term. You know, I, I don't I, have, I think we both have to admit that. Yeah. Yes. In the sense we, of we like, are, I don't we are have, both white dudes. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a lot of comparison points to kind of go like, yeah, I, I, I see something of my life in this. You know, I, I don't. And, you know, that that's kind of, you know, a, like you said, like a privileged thing. So I'd, I'd be curious how this plays to someone who doesn't necessarily have that background. Like maybe maybe things do get a bit too close to home in this at times or maybe it does stick out like, boy, them, you know, both mocking this thing and then playing around with it, you know, is a little fucked up. You know, maybe maybe to, get to other people would feel like that. But I, I personally going into it with my background, I, I think it worked well like that because it allow, also allowed them to engage the audience both at a, you know, more, more playful level, but also then, you know, kind of sneaking in the back with like, oh, we're being playful. We're having a lot of fun here. Oh, you have learned a lesson. <laughs> you learned a lesson, kids and parents. You didn't see it coming, but you learned. Boy, howdy, fuck you. We got there. Yeah. So, well, again, yeah. I think even from our position, again, if we're looking at it just through the frames of race, we, we might have like a completely different view. But I, I think the movie makes a really great, uh, uh, a great, uh, sorry, not a great move. I was, <laughs> was going to be a terrible rhyme. Um, it, it, it It's very intelligent in that it is about biases in general. You know, like we all make assumptions about other people when it comes to maybe someone's political background, you know, we might, or where they're from. Like we might assume someone from the South is always going to be, you know, like a right wing, you know, Republican or something like that. You know, our, our assumptions aren't always tied to race. It's tied to a lot of things. Certainly. So even I think both of us, we, uh, you know, we have maybe experienced similar assumptions about us throughout our lives. I mean, not not with as much social consequence uh, as other groups, but 
it's at least, you know, a recognizable phenomenon to pretty much all human beings, sure. which is why I think this movie plays really well. It, it doesn't require, you know, being about a, a racial minority who have faced, you know, uh, this horrible uh, systematic, you know, discrimination. It, it can also work for people, I think, who are privileged being able to see and recognize that phenomenon and maybe examine themselves. I mean, sir, I mean, that's the, 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 ideally that would be the plus side of this. I'm just, oh, more, that I'm would just, be the hopeful. <laughs> yeah. I'm just more the sense of like, I wonder how this plays to a group that is more traditionally like, you know, uh, in a disadvantaged position. Like what, what would their, yeah. you know, take away the sense of like, do they find this valuable? Do they find the, find this pandering? Like do they find this exploitative, you know? I, I'd or, be more or condescending, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there there is a possible rating of it. Um, so I, I think again, uh, you know, people who are listening to this and and hearing our opinions, understanding that the frame from which we're speaking, you know, I, I think helps understand that, like, you know, our viewpoint of this film is going to have, of course, its own bias. The whitest kids, you know. Yes. <laughs> so um, I, I want to go into the art. Um, because I think this is probably one of like the most visually stunning uh, films I've seen in a long time when it comes to CG. Um, the environments themselves are just... I mean, I, want, I, I kind of want to see a game that just lets you walk around the city just because the building designs are, are just so interesting. And, and it, it feels like they didn't just make a city and just put animals in it. It feels like a city that would have been built by, by these animals. Mm -hmm. Like you, you see a lot of um, the architecture itself is very much influenced by nature. Like you'll see a lot of curves and tree motifs when it comes to like support beams and like window shapes and and um, and, and um, also like the amenities. Be having to uh, build a city that can encompass all these different you know uh, sizes and body types and and just like you know living needs is just you know really interesting how they they solve that problem. Um, it, it's just it's just really well done. I mean, in the art, the character designs themselves are just absolutely charming. Um, they were done by an artist named Corey Loftus, who is just you know an utterly fantastic artist that I, I I've liked for a while. Um, it, I just the, the the designs. Um, I'm trying to think. It's it's hard to find the right words sometimes with it. Um, they're full of personality and they um. I don't know. I'm just kind of lost at the moment. <laughs> I mean, personally, I, I got the art book, and and the art book is like you know 160 pages, and then there's probably it could it, you know you could probably fill like eight books with the amount of art they've put into it, and it's it's you know the pre-production on this thing must have been insane. I mean, personally, my, my takeaway is like I I think it's very good you know design, very great art. Uh, personally, I would have preferred if the character designs were a little less uh, Disneyfied. In the sense that it still feels like, oh boy, we took the same Disney models that we've been using and all of these like sort of 3D things, and we, you know, turned up the animal slightly. Hmm. Personally, I would have preferred if they went more in the opposite direction with it. In the sense of if this was more uh, animal than you know people animal. I think it, so. So you wanted a little bit less anthropomorphization visually. Yes, that that, or maybe less abstraction in, in visually. See, I would I'd prefer to be more, you know, and I, I prefer to things were a little less clean, a little scruffier in the sense of like, in general, it. I I just look at Judy's face, and while it is not exactly the same as every other face that we've been getting recently. <laughs> it is also pretty much the same as every face we've been getting recently in the sense of like, boy, the the, the artistic fundamentals that they kind of scientifically develop a face is like, this is going to appeal to kids and everybody's going to find this cute. You know, those principles are still in full force in every bit of the major designs that they're working with. Everything feels very... It's a house style. It's a it's a house you know, style, it, but it also Disney. feels. I mean, you're looking back at Jungle Book. You look back at Robin Hood. I, I think they definitely borrowed certain stylistic elements from there, or were calling back to it when they were coming up with the overall style and how they were going to do it's, this. It's a house style, but it also feels so like I wouldn't say like by committee, but like you know, kind of like scientifically engineered to meet their exact purposes in terms of audience appeal. Like they've, they've focus tested this shit to death, which yeah, sure. That means it's going to fulfill its purpose, you know, grandly, I'm sure, compared to what I would have personally preferred. 
So you wanted something more adventurous yes. in visual style, perhaps. I mean, I've, there, there were scenes here where I was just kind of thinking, like, man, what would this be like if they had gone, like, say, for example, with, like, a, a, a fantastic Mr. Fox style, like, art style? Like, what would, you know, not necessarily yeah. in terms or of... Or Madagascar, for example, too, where they made the characters much more blocky and much more abstracted and strange and I mean, I hate that art style, know? but, so no. But, but yeah, but yes. That, but in general, that one was, you know, they, they squared off the fingers, they created different spiral for the nose shapes. I mean, it, that's that's what would be considered a more adventurous, you know, less realistic style. Sure. I mean, I would prefer ways. if they added more a grit to this. Like, this is, like, I want this to be like kind of like all those parody things of every time they do a show that has anthropomorphized, you know, animals, they have the scene where they just, you know, it's like super, you know, put on the screen instead of just like a very animal take on them. Like, oh, yeah, this is just a photo of a an dog talking, basically. I want it like that. I wanted it scruffier. I wanted it to feel more animal than, you know, anthropomorphized human because – to, so more animalistic. Certainly. And, and, you know, and to a certain degree, like the, the amount of anthropomorphism in you know, play here kind of took me out at times just because it's kind of like uh, – it's all, They're still behaving too much like Yeah, it's, it's still too human in general. Like I, I feel that they had to do that narratively, However, but still. Well, I mean to me to – me, well, let's take that argument further. If they did make it more animalistic, would it possibly have been a little bit of like an alienating layer for the I'm audience sure. or the theme? So I, I think they intelligently picked a level of, of, of human and animal to kind of balance it out. I mean, for, to, to make it disconnected enough, but also still keep that thread of connectivity to the audience and, and making them a recognizably human enough to empathize with sure, them. Sure, and I, I agree that it probably – what they the decision they made was not the wrong one, and that's not what I'm trying to say. Oh, yes. They made the correct yeah. one. Their, you know, pocketbooks well, are a, a playing month, month. that out, you know, in the sense of like, yeah. yes, they are very good at making sure that they make correct design decisions. Nobody's going to say that, you know, Disney is bad at that. They've got plenty of money to go into focus testing everything beforehand to make sure that they're making the correct design decisions. Maybe not their first decision going into the project, but they'll get there eventually. I'm, I'm just saying that personally, in terms of like what I would feel like, I'd have preferred something that was a little weirder visually or a little, you know, scruffier, you know, l a little gotcha. more David Attenborough than Frozen. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I see what you mean. Um, I, I would say one of the things, though, is uh, I would also compare it to like, because right now it seems like we're having this huge renaissance of cartoon animal films. I mean, there's this, uh, I don't know if you've seen the preview for this one called, I think, Sing. No, I haven't. Okay, I mean, compared the the way they've done the designs here versus that, and I just go, these are just a hundred times more charming. I mean, just the way the way they've done their proportions, the, the the appeal in general, I think is just it's just much stronger. I mean, and this is also Disney. I mean, they've been refining these artists for decades, you know, and 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 yes, I agree that sometimes that can result in too much of a reliance on a house style, but. I have to also admit grudgingly that it's effective. I mean, they're, they're, you know? <laughs> they're, like I said, their homogeneity has been paying them off in major dividends over the last few years because they, they did it. They found a style that pays off both in terms of audience appeal and in terms of merchandising appeal. They've been able to ride the oh, yeah. merchandising train to death. Yes. Well, that's. I mean, that's how they're able to then maintain – this level of quality production wise. Well, as well, it's also their way to maintain their, you know, death grip on the industry. Well, their profits, so. but I mean, but in order in order to even fund this type, I mean, again, the amount of research like they flew the artists off to Africa, they had them talk with all these experts. I mean, you know, production doesn't suddenly just start and you have the film done. I mean, this film also went through a whole bunch of different well, concepts. Sure. I mean, I don't I don't know if you you you've ever heard of what the original concept was going to be. Um, it was originally going to be, well, I mean, Amongst many, the, at very first, it was going to be like a, a 1960s style spy thriller with Nick Wilde as the I mean, main that character. Sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty cool. Um, but it would have it would have felt kind of generic, you know, like it, that. It's just that type of story, but now with cartoon animals. Mm. Uh, the second one, I, I think, was oddly, I, I think, kind of the, the darkest of it, where um, all the predators have to wear these shock collars. That will electrocute them whenever they feel things too strongly, out of fear that they might, you know, kill the 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 prey species. So they all have these collars around their necks, and uh, and and Nick uh, creates like a uh, a weird theme park to let them play out their instincts uh, safely and things like hmm. that. 
But like, I uh, and I, I'm kind of glad they didn't do that because in that case, you have a really fucked up society that's not worth saving. You know, the idea of having it being a utopia, you know, Zootopia in the title. I think that's a, a really strong way of doing it is that these characters, uh, there's at least an ideal that they have to live up to uh, that, you know, that I think the movie also acknowledges like, yeah, you know, the world was always broken, but we try anyway. I have a question real quick. Maybe I yes. missed this. What is it that the carnivores are eating now? Um, well, they only have mammals. So are they eating fish? Are they eating like lizards? They're, they're, we saw they're, they're in the background. There's a fish market that you see in um, in like the ice town. Mm -hmm. So I think they are probably eating that. But you also see, you I mean you see clawhaws are eating donuts and cereal. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think they're having the same thing. You know, it's kind of like um, hey, okay, hey, listeners, uh, if you are a vegan, your cat can't be fucking vegan because the cat just physiologically cannot be vegan okay guys but in, in this you know it's one of those things where you have the, their you know that's just how that nature works in that regard i think because these characters are evolved i mean they even have the idea that these characters yeah. evolved like they have the natural history museum so i mean we're we're having to assume a different form of biology to some degree um i think that's i think they're kind of omnivorous i mean we see uh we see like a nick eating blueberries and stuff i mean like, i mean foxes are relatively are human foods by nature but sure as well true but we we see claws are eating cereal you know uh and all this other stuff so i mean but yes we also only have certain species like we don't see birds we don't see reptiles where's the dolphins um, probably there's no dolphins i guess um there's no uh there's no uh i guess they eat bugs I think that actually was a thing, and so uh, if you, I liked on the our, uh, art book, and a lot there was a lot of like you know there was like a bug burger or insect mm. burger and things like that. Like that was I guess one of the solutions they found. You know, <laughs> so the thing was, it's one of those things that people have not you know you could examine it and find it really fucked up. And I think they I think by choosing only certain species that they have anthropomorphized, I think that was a smart choice. So it's like we don't have sentient fish. Doing that stuff, we don't, we haven't seen the yeah, other they're saving ones. Saving that for finding they hinted Nemo. that maybe there's other, like there's maybe you know reptiles and birds, but they're just you know not in this, I guess, country that they've developed. I don't know, but I, I think they they intelligently kind of picked uh, the characters and the species that they did to kind of avoid such complications. The, the one thing I was thinking about the entire time watching this film was like, huh, what about the fact that we know that deer will just occasionally just eat a bird because they feel like it. I don't or know. the fact that we, we're pretty sure that actually most herbivores will occasionally just eat meat if you let them. Like if, you, if, if yeah. they find but, it, but they'll they don't, do it. But, but, they don't, but, but they don't hunt. I think that was the kind of idea. Uh, a deer will find a, a bird that is being an idiot and will just immediately just crush that thing to death and eat it. That's a form yeah. of – it's not necessarily well, pred de predation. De deer are dicks anyway, so. <laughs> cows will do that too. Yep. Well, yeah. Well, I mean hamsters will eat their yeah. own young. Not sometimes, not even for a real reason. They'll just do it. I mean, <laughs> they're hungry. Okay, aren't we all? But I, uh, I think they, I think they, they kind of avoided a lot of that. Sure. Thankfully. I mean, again, it's kind of falls I mean, in. It, it is the specter threat that that exists, but they didn't, they didn't turn it into too much of a thing that kind of contradicts itself or becomes way too. I mean, confusing. they don't. I mean, it's I kind of like the whole thing job. I was bringing up with, like, if you try applying the like sort of real world analogs, it falls apart. Like, it that's not the kind of story that they're trying to tell. They're not trying to necessarily create a realistic world in the sense of like, boy, yeah, this this passes all possible, you know, checks towards you know realism. You know, there's no way that you could probably try, you know, tearing this apart. Like, I, if you. Think about it too much. It's internally it falls apart. consistent. It is internally at least. consistent, but it's also you know it's not that kind of story where it's trying to be you know yes. so you know they're not creating a science fiction tale of what if there was yes. a world on a distant planet where rabbits and exactly. foxes. Exactly, I was just like, about no, to bring up the it's genre. Not like yeah. that. It's it's more. It's like like we've been saying. It's more playful about all that. You know, they're, they they kind of play with the whole food and predation thing rather than making it a major feature by any means, because that would just make things overly complicated, and that and darker than sure. It and it would be. also mean that they would have to devote way too much, you know, film real estate to trying to justify and make things work. Like, oh, it's because they're eating bug burgers, and here's why bugs aren't intelligent. 
Anyways. Well, it would it would have been unnatural for those characters to have to bring it up because that's just the way the world is for them. I mean, th you know, it, it would have been really oddly exp I mean, the most exposition they do is like the first scene in the the film itself when, she, when they're doing the 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 school sure, play. Which was a cute approach. Which I love. I loved. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I liked her performance in that at the end, what, as she's uh, doing the streamer of blood and then goes for the mm -hmm. ketchup. Uh, I, I liked, uh, I thought the humor of the film was pretty good overall. I mean, I don't think it had as many jokes as, let's say, like uh, Wreck-It Ralph did, but I, I think it had enough to be, you know, fairly funny. Sure, uh, though a lot of them ultimately end up being just like, boy, this animal is sure animal like puns. what it isn't, yeah. or this animal sure is like what you expect, you know? Like, who didn't see the Mr. Big being a small animal thing from a million miles Mile. away? Like, that was a such an obvious thing. And then him being... But that's not the types of gags I found no. really funny. I found the small little gags funny. Kind of like ha having him, you know, having to try to kiss the ring, but like... The ring is mm -hmm. so fucking tiny. Like, how do you do it? And the, there's subtle little things, the animation of him struggling. Or when he's eating the tiny yeah, cake. That was that was good. Like, those types of things, that's the stuff I found really funny. Like, the character-based gags. The animal pun thing, are, are, you know, I think it, it's the low-hanging fruit. I mean, fruit. but it, those I mean, are the most common movie. ones that they do, to be fair. Oh, yeah. But the stuff that I really appreciated were the sure. smaller ones. Or, or, like, the great little, uh, little quips or, or, like... You know, oh, you you know, we're safe, and then they they crack through the the, the vines and things like. There's a whole bunch of great little yeah, things the, the going more, on there. So I, I like the those more types subtle of gags. sort of like sort of almost physical gags of you know the uh, the animal stuff where it's not necessarily really obvious stereotype stuff. That those were like you said, those are the best ones. Uh, the Oh, uh, the incidental, the, the music one where um, she's had her she's had her, her her spirit broken, and every song on the radio is like from bad to worse to worse to eventually one saying i'm a loser and, and then the stuff with the roommates there i found kind of funny with like, oh, the paper thin wall that was like, great oh you leave you leave no, there alone the you heard her on the phone it's like it's like a, uh, it's another day tomorrow it'll be another day tomorrow yeah but it could be worse <laughs> Though, that, that was <laughs> those were that was those were voiced by the directors actually yeah but the, that was pretty that was funny. Cool. Uh, I think the, the the gag in the movie that I honestly laughed the most at was the uh, pirated movie gag. Yes. Oh man! In, when I in the theater I was in, the audience lost their shit. I mean, it worked really gag. well. Like Disney knew what this was. They knew how what they're dealing with here. I wonder. I wonder yeah, how much of that joke I, I played that was... in like a foreign country that has you know significant markets that kind of get are involved with that. Oh, the the great the yeah, great. I wonder how thing. that plays I mean, like, in like yeah. the gray market countries. Like, well, how would like a China, which is a very prolific. Oh, this is this this movie is actually beaten records. Yeah, so in I wonder China. how that joke plays there. I wonder if they <laughs> if they love it. I wonder if they changed that joke. Well, they actually did change a few things um, depending on where you're located. Um, really minor. I mean, again, besides the name of the movie, um, one of the newscasters would be a different species and voice actor depending on I saw where that. it was released. So. Yeah, so in Japan, he's a, uh, a tanuki. You have, um, I think they're a jaguar in South America. Um, we got moose. And, well, moose, we, we have a moose. I think England has it too, but they have a different actor mm. for it. Um, and then, God, there's another one. It's a, Oh, of course, uh, China, Makes it's a sense. panda. Um, if you look at the, the, the movie poster, you actually see the panda, the tanuki, and the other ones in the background mm. too. So that's kind of cool. Um, so there's kind of some regional changes, but I like it being subtle as opposed to like, oh, here's an entirely new scene that we filmed for the Chinese audience that just come, mm -hmm. comes out of nowhere that, is some, that some films have been doing. I thought doing small little things like that is kind of fun. Oh, Australia, it's quality. That also makes sense. Yes. So those are the ones that I know of. They might have other ones, but that's those are the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, one of the other things I found visually, going back to the visuals I remembered, is just the lighting in the film itself. Like the way they, they did the time of day, the, the, the positioning of the camera, the, the, the cinematography overall in this was like in certain shots were just absolutely beautiful. I think like the, the opening shot to um, the, I guess it was a formerly an insane asylum yeah. where all the... That that opening shot of it is just it's it's hauntingly beautiful in in the way they did that. Um, you know, some of the scenery when they go to the uh, the jungle based area. I mean, it 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 
It's like I would print this out and frame it just the way the composition and the lighting and, and everything is so meticulously arranged, even if it's cluttered. Just compositionally, every, you know, almost every shot is just, just so beautifully done. I mean, just, you know, the cinematography is, is something I really appreciate in this. And the, the, the use of color and light is really interesting. Um, uh, on the, the you, you'll notice in certain scenes, I think they added emphasis to the, the uh, canister of fox repellent at mm -hmm. her waist. Because in certain scenes, it's the most colorful thing. Uh, or at least the most saturated color thing. So it doesn't directly draw your eye there, but if you see it, you, you know, if you're looking through the scene, you'll notice it, you know, and, and that fits the character, you know, when, when Nick says like, hey, you know, don't think I didn't see that, when, you know, when we first met that you had that, you know, canister of fox repellent. Um, oh, I loved mm -hmm. the parent characters. You know, the, 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 the first things that the parents say, I just loved it because it felt like such an, um, a self-aware anti-Disney-ness to it. Because they're like, you know, it's like, you know why we're happy? It's because we settled. You know, like, don't try. <laughs> it was just, ah, uh, I don't know. Some, something about that I just found really absolutely hilarious because it's mm -hmm. a Disney movie. You know, you're coming into this film with the expectations of what, you know, these types of films try to teach kids, the, the, the normal messaging. You know, it, it goes against that. I mean, in, in general, when I came into this, I was not expecting, you know, some kind of treatise on, um, you know, stereotyping and marginalizing an outgroup in order to create fear and foster an authoritarian fascist regime. You know, that's not something I was expecting from a Disney movie, but it's right. there. Um, in terms of uh, uh, voice acting performances, I thought they were really effective. Yeah, they, they were pretty good. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel like wowed necessarily about it. Well, I think the scene, I think there was a scene that kind of got to me pretty well performance-wise is when Judy is apologizing to Nick um, to repair the friendship and things like that. I thought that was a really well done scene. Um, I mean, overall, there's just some, I mean, when it comes to acting also, just the, the, the physical acting, you know, the way the characters gesticulate, the small, subtle things. Like, you'll, you'll notice in certain scenes the way they have her twitch her nose when, when she's scared. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll do small little things like that. Um, you know, the way characters will move their feet, the way they change their posture before they say certain words, it's just meticulously acted out. And I, I just really mm -hmm. love how they did that. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm also really glad that they allowed it to get dark in certain areas. You know, I, I think a lot of films are not willing to kind of go to certain places or, or, or willingness to, to kind of be frightening or to, you know, to, to have a certain level of sadness. You know, it, it, they, they're scared that um, the audience will be too repulsed by it. And I, I kind of like the fact that they went into certain areas here. It, it, had, it had more complexity yeah. than Disney films often do because, you know, the one thing Disney is not known for is subtlety, both in terms of like, you know, how they, what they <laughs> actually have as their narratives and also in terms of narrative situations, I mean, the, the, the class example I always think of when I think about Disney not being particularly subtle with their, you know, way they handle narratives is the sort of approach that they took to uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. That's always the thing oh, I think God. of, like, man. It could have been such a good film. I mean, they, they ruined they having <laughs> Tony J as Frollo, which is perfect casting. But then they kind of like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of like took what was a very complex character and a very complex narrative of a lot of shitty people and made it very straightforward. Oh, you got your good guys, you got your bad guys. They added the fucking yeah, gargoyles, well, well, too. Yeah. They, they, I mean, when you look, I mean, you know, I hate to be going off topic, but oh, my God, you know, like looking at that film and, and the color and the just the darkness of it. I mean, it could have been just an amazing work of art. It might not have been, you know all ages family entertainment i mean the original work it's based off of is uh, not everyone dies um uh but you know i i think that 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 fear of of being adventurous uh, of possibly alienating an audience by by going to places that make them uncomfortable you know that that caused them to go in the other direction and then turn it into just this tonal cacophony that uh, of light and dark that just turned into I mean, like the other thing mess. i was is that you know they they went into there with some amount of darkness of like, oh, yeah, the guy is racist against, you know, gypsies, you know. But they don't bring into any yeah. of the complexity the fact that, yes, in the original story he is, 
but he's also not a terrible guy in other areas. It's almost as if everybody in this film is just kind of, or not in this film, but in the original you know novel, are terrible beat people in different situations doing different things rather than the story where you have the bad guys and you have the good guys and they face off. It's not, it's not nearly as dark and dire. It's yeah. not black and, and, and white. And certainly, you know, yeah. this work is not, you know, it is not no original hunchback of Notre Dame in terms of a complex or anything. But it does have a lot more going on in terms of, you know, subtlety and, you know, you know, complexity. And it's motivations. Like you have the, the mayor character himself, you know, he does the wrong thing for the, I mean, as he says, you know, it's a case of doing the wrong yeah, thing and for the right reasons. How about the, the, the kid that was picking on her as, you know, uh, when she was a kid, the, the fox, you know, Gideon, ultimately yeah. being revealed like, yeah, he, he's very regretful of what he did, you know, and he himself turned around on it. That, that is more complex than a straightforward. Uh, Idris yeah. Elba's character, for example, you know, he's kind of an asshole through a lot of the film, but you kind of understand why on some level. I mean, and he has a whole bunch of biases that, that, you know, make him not to be, a, you know, again, a huge asshole, but he also makes some really strong points uh, later in the film. Again, he goes like, you know, Judy, the world has always been broken. You didn't break it, but this is why we're here. And I thought that was a really mm -hmm. interesting point. Um, that reminds me, like, I think one of the most devastating scenes for me was uh, uh, Nick's right. childhood. Like that, that hit me really hard because I was like, oh shit. I mean, I never went through anything directly like that, but I, I had, I had moments of like that type of thing, you know, of, of group gang up violence and things like that. It's, it's, you know, it, that, that thing was just absolutely fucking devastating See, and horrifying. Uh, I, that scene was effective, but the, the way that they went into that scene felt so abrupt to me mm. that it didn't feel that natural like the transition to it it's like i'm gonna tell you about my childhood now like wh wh where did this come from it, so it felt it felt like they forced it so it's not the scene itself yeah, it's, it's how it's they both introduced how they introduced it. it and like where they introduced yeah. it and why they did it felt like okay this is the time of the film that we're going to justify why nick is like he is because we're going to have him go through his arc now it's like oh you, you you had a very clear narrative purpose by putting the scene here. This hasn't been borne out by, you know, uh, the sort of, you know, like, oh, this is the natural place in the film and the natural way that this had to play out. Like, no, this is the way that you, for your structure mm. to play out in terms of pacing, this is where it is. Got it. So you, you, it became the mechanics of it became she, noticeable. Certainly. It, to it you. just felt like, it felt more like I, yeah. I could feel the hands of the directors in work when they placed that scene there. Gotcha. That, that, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, I think, but uh, again, the scene, oh, the scene itself, itself is, is very know, as, as an event that's uh, as observed and, you know, I think it's something that's a recognizable phenomenon. Uh, I thought that mm -hmm. was what made it very powerful. So, yeah, I, I, could, I could definitely see that it felt like, okay, we need to put this scene here because we kind of need it. You know, that was kind of right. what, what you're looking at it in terms of. I could see that. Hmm. Trying to think of where else I want to kind of go with examining this one because there's just a lot of little areas. Um, I liked the way the 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 overall yeah. villain in this I thought was a really interesting thing because you you do see why she is the way she is. She doesn't have to explain it that much, which was really nice. I mean, she does do her little bit of a speech, but that's a villain thing. But they didn't spend a whole they didn't do a flashback to her or anything because they showed throughout the film, you know, the type of bullshit she has to go through. You know, the, the, and also that there is a, a you know, and that Judy goes through a lot of that too. You know, the, the, the being, a, you know, a smaller animal with all the different expectations of being meek and things like that mm -hmm. and having to fight against that. You know, Judy overcame it versus the villain did not and she went in a different direction. So that's what makes it really interesting is that she is kind of like a shadow right. of the protagonist. And I think that makes for really effective villains and also as a really great thing thematically, you know, so you can say like, just because, you know, oh, our situations were different. It's like, well, you know, kind of, but there was a con, there was a decision, uh, you know, a decision point between the two of them that caused the different outcomes. So I, I thought that was a really effective thing. It was also really cool because it, for the, in terms of establishing the mystery, it made a lot of sense because you see her kind of pulling the strings in the background early on yes. in the film, kind of. You know, she's the, she's the one that gets her to 
even get the case. You know, it's like, she's like, oh, I, you know, I texted the mayor about it. It's done. It's already done. You know, she, she's done that. She constantly says, hey, come to see me if you need help. You know, she does that a couple times. Um, even on the phone, if you look in her office, there is the, um, there's a note on the phone. Like, I think it was like, call Benny. And that's the, that's the ram, the name of the ram that they find later that's mm -hmm. growing the stuff. So I thought that was really neat. And then there's all sorts of little things. And so as a mystery, it actually works out pretty well. Um, you could definitely see, you know, one, once you figure, you know, it, it, you do see it coming eventually. I think later on in the film, you realize it's going to be her. But it's still, you know, the, getting to that point, you don't see it from a mile away. You might see I it, mean, you know, 100 feet the away. Her being the culprit wasn't necessarily immediately obvious, but where they were going with it felt completely obvious. Like at no point did I buy yes. into the oh yeah yeah they're they're the savage yeah like that just that for miles away it's yeah. like yeah someone's doing something someone drugged them or something like that that felt like an immediate like kind of like uh, yeah, yeah it's a given that the, the that sort of plot element wasn't particularly complex or you know surprising but it was effective for what it was yeah I think they handled it really well um, I, I love the various kind of uh, mm -hmm. the various hustles. Uh, I, I love the way they did the the popsicle thing. the The whole popsicle scene was great. Um, the little things of her being really condescending yeah. to him was kind of funny. Oh, you're so articulate! You know, it's like, oh god. <laughs> I, I kind of liked how they how they did that part of her. You know, as the protagonist, that she does have those flaws. They didn't make her this mm -hmm. you know perfect person. And and they kind of showed how you know even someone who might seem you know, who is, you, you might be uh, well-meaning, but we all have those biases. And I thought that was a really, a great way of doing that. And plus, it, it made for a couple really just good jokes when, when she has that kind of right. condescending attitude. You know, even to her parents, too. That was kind of, <laughs> in general. Um, the one thing I really felt that was kind of weird is uh, uh, Shakira's character yeah, kind of didn't feel necessary that, to me. I don't know where they were going with from it. It almost... It felt really anime, I, if I'm going to be honest. Well, she's the only one that had hair. In, in I mean, human to be style fair, hair. some gazelles are like that. Some certain they, they species. Do, they I don't that? know what species of gazelle she was, but there were certain huh. things like that. I mean, we're, animals are weird, but it's one of the things. Like, I got, I got, like, I got the like <laughs> the way she was so key and important as like an emotional core. Felt like boy, whether they watch like a bunch of idol anime before this, like what the fuck, you know? That was that was the point of comparison I got coming into that. I was just like, what? what? It feels Japanese. Yeah, because we don't really, at least, at least, yeah, yeah, at least in the U.S., we don't. I mean, yeah, if you go to New York and you go into the taxi cab and they have like some random like actor be like, "Hey, welcome to New York. Here, we let me tell you know." We have that, but like, we don't really do the kind of idol thing that kind of represents the city as much. That that is, as you're saying, I think much more of a Japanese yeah. thing. So that, that that itself felt alien. Otherwise, I could understand, like, hey, you know, you have celebrities being activists and things like that. So having her being the activist scene where they're having the protest, I thought that was perfectly fine. But it just it felt weird otherwise when she was there that she was yeah, kind and of the fact that she was otherwise. basically like a like almost like a messianic figure was it was weird. Yeah, that 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 was the part is that she she was she sold the message oh, too directly. We, I wish I could, my my Zootopia would go back to the way it was. Yeah, and again, I thought that was a nice contrast when you look at Idris Elba's character saying like, "No, it's not. You know, the world isn't perfect. It is a messy place, and it's been broken." I mean, even uh, Judy's you know narration at the end is like, "You know what? The world is a messy place, but we try anyway, and you know we're supposed to do what we do." Uh, I guess the only real troubling aspect I found was the idea of police itself. I mean, just because we've, for the last couple of years uh, of looking at policing in America, I mean, yes, the problem has been existing for decades, but I'm talking about in terms of just the, the increased media scrutiny uh, of policing in the U.S. It, it, making police protagonists is a difficult thing. Um, and I think they handled it well, though, because I think they... I, I think they at least spoke to what I mean. I mean, I think be. they did it effectively you know? in the sense that they 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 played with the normal conventions and tropes of policing. You know, they didn't. You know, they could. Yeah, but without making it into our heroes forever. They, they I go, mean, they no, don't. It's a complicated they don't necessarily thing. go into like, oh, it's super complicated. You know, where it's like, you know, they're, they're outside the law or whatever. They they don't go into that direction either, but. 
Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's not really what they're going. For kids. <laughs> I, I think it was effective. Like it was, it, it never wasn't something that ever came to my personal mind, you know. And I, you know, I, though, though I'm not necessarily yeah. the person that pays the most attention. I think they handled it well yeah, enough it, that it, I didn't it worry about effectively it, so. enough. It didn't feel like it was tone deaf. And there, there's been a lot of works that do have a police theme that do feel very tone deaf, particularly if they come to like, yeah, the police are breaking the law. Yeah, they're gonna bring the justice in their own hands. Yeah, and it's like, well, vigilantism. No, yeah, don't, don't talk about that anymore. That's bad. Well, I, I well, I, I think the the reason they handled it really well, and I think the way they did is when they decide to start using her as propaganda, her going like, "This is mm -hmm. not what I was here for to do," you know. And I thought that was a really good way of of kind of countering the way police in, you know, propagandist states are often kind of used, you know, uh, as a certain symbol of of uh, authority and power. Um, I, I think what's really just so interesting is how well they handled um, moral panics or or social panics. You know the way the way they did the the interviewing scene uh, when when mm -hmm. she's giving the press conference. I mean, you know, I thought that was a really interesting way of doing that. The the way we see the news broadcast go through, the way it's kind of the way it then trickles down to you know Clawhauser being you know well you know I'm not I don't I guess they don't want me to be right. the face of the department anymore. You know, like how how much we we how much stock we put into certain symbolic things or or, or visual things or, or superficial things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought they handled that really interestingly. You know, and it's also again it's alarming because you know um, as of this recording, looking at the political situation in the U.S. and, and various countries right now, where there is a, a rise in in um, authoritarian thinking and and the utilization of uh, fear of the other. You know, it, I thought that was a very Certainly, prescient. Certainly, especially when it's couched it through way. a sort of, you know, uh, perversion of populism. And that's the aspect that they had in this film. Like, yes. oh, the whole goal wasn't so much as to, you know, like, yes, we're going to arrest all predators. We're going to turn, you know, our 90% of the population against the predators amongst us. And then they won't be able to do anything. And if they do, hey – we can then act at them at that point because we'll have enough power once we have everybody behind us. It's it's kind of a yes, and it's also around one figure also trying to solidify the power in sure. for themselves individually as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so the the opportunism that that is, that is a part of there. So I I, I just I liked how they handled that. I, I thought that was a really effective thing. I mean, I don't know if kids will necessarily understand that, but I think a lot of the adults that that have gone to see this have have, you know, taken note of that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really interesting theme. So, um, trying to think of what else. Uh, were there were there any other things that popped to think out if to you? There's any other stuff I wanted to touch on. Uh... No, I think I kind of we kind of got all the big you know bullet points that I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Well, let's talk about because this thing has been so successful. Where do you think they can take it from here? Um, I mean, these types of things are just ripe for sequels and things like that. But my argument is that um, I would rather actually like to see a TV series off of this because I think the world was so well developed and I want to see more of the city and, and the way that works. But I don't want to have to suddenly have them create a whole new arc for the main characters, which is what a sequel does. A TV series will let you kind of explore that world without having to undo the progress they made and then just, you know, create a, a, a new conflict ad hoc. You know, so it would be kind of neat if there was kind of a, a you know, a, a procedural drama series, you know, you know, police procedural, you know, uh, Parks and Rec or Brooklyn Nine-Nine style See, thing in this kind of world. I thought would be a, a neat way. So the issue if I have they with that is that the it. more time that they spend in this world, and the more time that they have to flesh out the periphery of it, the more likely that the sort of uh, structure of it will, in the larger questions, the larger will become questions, more apparent, yeah. or they'll start having to address them. At which point, again, the whole mm. you know thing that they're able to get away with the fact that like, boy. This doesn't result in a lot of weird sort of situations and questions because you know it's it's such a lighthearted, short, tight thing that 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 stuff then comes to the face and they have to address it, you know, to a certain degree. And, and it'll probably be not even have to; they'll embrace addressing it because they have some need something to talk about. It's either that or they completely drop almost all of those tropes together because I mean I think about most you know Disney television follow-ups to movies. They tend to drop all sort of, you know, 
elegance and tightness and darkness and you know they kind of they fall into the serialization because that's what works that's what you know they have to do for those you know for those sort of things and i think that the longer that they dwell in this world the more the the seams will show uh personally i don't i don't think they necessarily mm. should you know venture back into it i think maybe they they should just look at this and say like boy we didn't have to do another frozen exactly as it turns out to sell huh I guess we can continue to experiment in interesting ways and make profits while doing so. Yeah. So basically, you want it to be able to stand alone as, as I mean, an I think, art piece yes. on its own. I would like it to. Would you would like if it only to. for the fact that <laughs> the more that they go back to it, the more they're going to ruin what it is. Hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely could see that argument. I, I still say that I, I just looking when I look through the art book and I look at the environments that they created and just, you know, all the possibilities of the characters, because, again, we only get to see small pieces of them. You know, when it comes to as a, again, if I looked at it more like if they made it more of a, um, uh, again, more of like a Parks and Rec style kind of comedy that is more lighthearted, I think they could definitely get away with that because that would not examine you know, as much as the film itself does. So it would it would be based off of, but maybe not necessarily um, too See, tightly I, tied I don't, to I don't the feel film like itself, they could actually do any degree of the tension that's in the film if they did that, though. Like, that would, they would have to abandon all pretense yeah. of it. They would just have to be, yeah, it's Animal World, and everything is great here. Oh, here, what's in this episode? <laughs> oh, they're trying to find a stolen car. Who? What wacky antics are they getting into? You know, that's 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 what it would be. Yeah, I could. It would it would feel too much like they're just replacing uh, the well, human character. That and they would probably no become that. entirely animal based punny punnery and jokes. Like, oh yeah, this it's this thing gotcha. that has this reputation, and we're gonna go into that. You know, like oh, <laughs> Josie the skunk wants to become a perfume specialist, and oh, Judy is gonna help her gotcha. out. Gotcha. Well, see, I see. I'm I'm hoping that they would actually be, you know. Better than that, but yes, I I, I definitely see that that would I mean, be the easy the easy fall for them to fall are into. the ones that almost everybody falls into, like that they're the ones that are yeah. very large, and even though they're very obvious, there are advantages sometimes into falling into those pitfalls, as it turns out. So you know, from a or at least pretending well, you're I about mean, more to, the and sense then of going like, the other way, it's easy, and easy is often cheap. And effective when you're trying to make mm. a lot of content that you don't necessarily need to put in that much complexity in order to sell. And, and, and if you're doing a tie-in sequel, gotcha. be it a film or you know a, a series, you're not necessarily going into it from the artistic love of it. You're going into the, oh, there's yeah. more money on the table. We should go take that money on the table. Yeah. Well, again, I'm only doing this as an exercise just because it's very clearly good. there's something going to happen with this just because it has done. I know, mean, that's true of almost every absolutely Disney gangbusters. thing these days. I mean, you know. Oh, I know. So, I mean, um, let's see. Did you have a favorite character? Maybe just from a design I, I like or Chief you know, Bongo a lot, though I don't know how much of that was me really liking Idris Elba in general. I, I just. Elba. He's oh, yeah, so he did good. such a, like a good job a in general. with that. Kind of like, yeah, the, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I liked the, I liked the, um, him mm -hmm. in contrast with uh, Clawhauser. Yeah. I thought that was a really nice thing. Um, uh, with the, the, the joke about uh -huh. them using the same app was pretty funny. Um, I actually like the way they integrated how people use technology without it being like, hey, mm -hmm. we're up with the things, the Twitters, the uh, emojis. Like, it didn't do that kind of... It's like, no, they, they, they use it just like people in real life yeah, and do, it didn't, and it didn't feel make a big deal out like of it. It's going to become supremely dated with the march of technology. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it goes forward, but still. Yeah, it, well, it, it's just... A, it, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think they, they dealt with it in uh -huh. the sense that this is just a part of the way things work. You know, like having her recording the evidence on the phone. Like that's just like a, a thing that people can do now. Like it, it but it didn't make what? a big deal. It's like on yeah. your phone? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm so used to a lot of these people doing like, you know, they're, they're trying really hard and really poorly to integrate, you know, memes or technology, you know, like mm. just to, to make it seem like they're with it. 
So it, it was nice to see them integrate that without it right. being painful. <laughs> um, as for me, for the character designs, I, I just like the Nick design in general. I thought they handled the color really well. Like they had him stand out, but not too much. Um, apparently that was a struggle for them because, you know, if they did with the uh, traditional Fox for colors, it would have screwed up the compositions. So they actually had to, you know, tone down and change the colors in certain ways to make it like mm -hmm. fit into the background better. Um, I also just like the, like some of his hustles and his, I thought his lines were pretty, some of his lines and jokes are pretty funny. Uh, particularly, um, I think one of the best jokes is him explaining why Mr. Big hates him so much. You know, it's like, I might have sold him a rug made out of the fur of a skunk's. But, <laughs> and then her, her reaction after that was just such a great, you know, same thing with the DMV scene too. Right. I think the, the, them playing off of each other, I thought mm -hmm. was really good. I thought in terms of performance wise. So I, I just enjoyed that, you know, the, the camaraderie between the two characters and also the conflict between the two characters. And it didn't go into, you right. know, yeah, I, I think they, they played territory. off pretty well as a, you know, dichotomy, you know, ultimately they became more alike towards the end. But yes, they, they played off real well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the, the hustle at the end using the blueberries was great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, overall, I definitely do suggest it. I have seen it both in 2D and 3D at this point. Um, luckily, I had a friend who hadn't seen it yet, so I got the chance. Um, the 3D was actually pretty good. Um, it doesn't really add anything in this case. Um, in certain films, the 3D effect is, is really useful. In this one, it's not bad. It's just it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't add or subtract anything other than color. Um, 3D films have a certain percentage of light loss. That's just a natural thing of wearing polarized lenses. So if you want to get the full uh, range of color and the color design, uh, the 2D will be better for you films? in that regard. Aren't they nearly at that point now? Or so few people are going to them? Um, I, I think as a gim, I think as, well, yeah, because yeah. it's so much more expensive for very little. I mean, again, like, I'm not against 3D. Um, I'm only against it when it, it's just for no reason. Like if there's, you know, having a reason to do the 3D in you're actually using the depth of space, you're actually using, you know, the, the, the effect that it gives you, um, you know, I, I'd say like, I think stop motion films do pretty interesting stuff with, with, with a 3D, just because we already recognize it as real world objects moving so that they, through the 3D effect kind of adds to sure. that, that, that strange feeling about it. But whereas other films like, you know, um, where they rich retroactively try to make it into 3D, um, and it just looks like a weird bunch of like you know a, a diorama. It's really weird. Uh, that just adds nothing other than an extra right. you know fifteen dollars to your ticket price. You know, so I, I'm only against it when it has no purpose visually or thematically. So, but yeah, I think in this case it, it looks nice. I mean, they did a good job with it in terms of 3D. It's just not necessary. So you know, if you like 3D it's perfectly fine. It just doesn't add or subtract anything from it. So, um, it's, uh, I, I think it's going to be running for a while. <laughs> it's broken Frozen's records. So, we'll see. Um, I do suggest the art book. Um, it has, I mean, just the sketches and the environmental design that came from it is just really beautifully done. And, and seeing some of the earlier premises that they had tried and abandoned were, were kind of fascinating. So, that's all included in the book as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't I think, think so. I, don't, I mean, I Anything think it was else? overall a pretty good film. Uh, I don't think I'm nearly as high on it as some people are. Um, I think some people are high on it yeah. in part because they they sympathize with it in uh, more complex reasons. I might say one way of wording it. Uh, uh, personally, I don't I don't have <laughs> such a uh, association with it, but uh, and. Going into it, I, I thought it was a perfectly fine film. I, I appreciated it for the kind of complex message it was trying to take, and I, I find it interesting how successful it is as a film while also going in there with something that's a little trickier. Uh, I, I hope that means that Disney is going to hopefully be a little more uh, audacious in terms of the type of messaging that they're allowed to play around with. Mm. Because if they're able to get away with, you know, doing stuff like this and people are like, yeah, we're, we're all for this. Like, what happens if they really actually try to push the boundaries? I think, I think that's what's kind of interesting about it is this, this film felt very age neutral. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if that makes sense. Like, the characters were very much adults, and they thought, and they behaved like adults. You know, this wasn't adults behaving like children for a children's movie. You know, and, and I so I, I really appreciated that. I, I like the fact that it, it, it works for all ages and on different levels for everybody. You know, it, it's it's rather than it being a kid's movie where they just put a couple adult references in. Right. You know, I, I thought I, I like that type of universal entertainment sometimes. It's it's nice to have that. It's not it's nice not to be condescended to, mm-hmm. you know, as, as an audience. So I, I, I definitely agree with you that I, I think this would be really interesting if um if this is a a, a, a a road mark towards letting them be more experimental and audacious and 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 willing to take you know risks in terms of both visual and subject matter, mm-hmm. so we'll see. I mean, I think in general they've been on a pretty good good hit lately. You know, I thought Wreck It Ralph had some of those themes as well, of a, of an existential crisis. <laughs> um, so we'll see. I, I think they're they're kind they've kind of taken the place of Pixar. I think in terms of doing. Just you know, new and interesting stories. I mean, they kind of are Pixar now. I mean, they're techni- kind of. They're, they're, kind they're of. two I mean, studios, but at the same time, they're, they're so owned interweb. by the same. But they seem to be managed and creatively, they seem to be taking different. I don't know. They're both three you know, D CG paths. now. I could hardly. If you told me this was like a, I'm Pix- trying to talk about storytelling wise. They and if you to, told you know, me a Pixar, this was a Pixar film, I don't necessarily know. I would have like been like, oh, that felt weird for a Pixar film. <laughs> like you know, if you told well, me that for visually, way, I could tell. Well, I mean, well, I, mean I, I guess because I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm steeped in it, so I can tell the the difference between the house styles of it. Uh, I'm actually glad this is a Disney movie as opposed to a, a Pixar one visually, but that's just you know my own preferences. I miss traditional animation. I do too, but hey, it still exists in some form. I mean, just so. just not Disney. Yeah, just, just not, not films. Disney. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe they'll bring it back someday. We'll see. They've done it. They've done occasional dips back in. So sure. Um, they did it with a, a a Winnie the Pooh movie that was actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, well, let let's move on to what we're going to be talking about next time. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, I guess I want to explain the premise about why I'm choosing this one next. Um. So there is this upcoming uh CG movie called Sausage Party, and. It looks to be. I I don't want to say like um you know from the start that it looks like it's going to be like one of the worst things ever made because I you know I I, I can't uh, rightfully say that because I can't possibly encompass the entire universe in, in in things that haven't made, but it looks pretty pretty down there. <laughs> um, the script leaked for this film and it is filled with, um I'd say seventy five percent racism. And then 25% sexist things. This is a pretty uh, good, you know, proportion, I guess. Yeah, uh, visually horrifying. Um, I guess it's trying to play with the idea of, like, when we anthropomorphize food, you know, in advertisements, and we don't really think about the logical conclusion of it, but it doesn't seem to actually be going in that direction. It's, uh, otherwise, it's horrible. But every, but But everybody is making comparisons to another, I guess I would say, infamous film. Food Fight. A classic. Uh, a, a veritable classic in, in terrible movie circles. Um, it, it was, I guess, the, 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 the nadir of uh, product placement culture and, <laughs> I guess, um, e- empty-headed animation studio forming. Just, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, but it, it, it's special. It, it, is, it is definitely special. Um, the backstory behind it is pretty funny. Um, Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to get a hold of normally, but hey, thanks to the internet, you'll be able to find it. Uh, it'll, it's called Food Fight. I think it has an exclamation mark in the name. <laughs> so that is what we'll be doing next time. Uh, don't watch it alone because it is painful. <laughs> so you have to share that pain. Yeah, you have to share that pain. You have to inflict it on your friends and family. So just fair warning. That is what we're covering next time. Hashtag brands. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. They're, they're, they're uh, icons, otherwise known as Ikes. Hashtag brands. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you can always reach us at email, uh, adthepodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, mine is at R.Y. Magnuson. And I'm hashtag brands. Yes. Also known as at S.A. Zorak. Hashtag brands. 
hashtag brands. It's all in the same title. Uh, also, uh, we are on iTunes, so I don't have to keep on sending everybody links to the new episode. It does automatically update. Um, subscribing, uh, rating, and reviewing helps us out a lot. It makes it easier for people to find us because of search algorithms. Uh, Zorak also puts up episodes on YouTube with extra high quality. I uh, export it with a much less lossy uh, filter on it. So, A, if you enjoy the beautiful dulcet tones of our voices, please check out the YouTube channel. Yeah, and, and if you enjoy what we're doing, hey, uh, feel free to let us know and also tell your friends. Help support yes. our hashtag brand. It is a labor of love, hashtag brand. So we will see you guys next time.